chapter 15. We've been focusing on life over the past few weeks. One of the messages was focusing on choosing life. It's really that decision between choosing death and choosing life. And Jesus says to choose life in Him. And we said that once you have chosen life, then the responsibility we have is to share life. Once we know that there is life, we're to go and to tell others about that life that is found in Christ. Then we talked about the fact that after we've shared life, we are to celebrate life. And a celebration of life should happen every time we gather as a body of Christ. We ought to gather together to celebrate the life that Christ gives to us and gives to others. We also saw last week that one of my favorite pictures of Jesus, I gave to you a portrayal of Jesus, is the fact that He was laughing and that He was smiling and joyful because Jesus rejoiced greatly. And He rejoiced because His disciples discovered that they had power over the enemy and also that they knew that their names were written and engraved in heaven. And that is a reason to rejoice. So Jesus gives us an example of rejoicing. Today I want to take that a step further and I want you to see the master teacher. Jesus is the greatest teacher who ever lived. He's the master teacher. And in his teaching, he's going to teach us about the need to rejoice, the importance of rejoicing. It's found here in Luke chapter 15. In Luke chapter 15, there is a parable that Jesus tells. Now when you look at it, many people would look at it as three parables. But it's actually one parable. If you'll say Jesus spoke this parable to them. It's one parable that has three stories. And those three stories are all linked together with the theme that we are to rejoice when that which is lost is found or that which is dead has come back to life. There is reason to rejoice. And so he uses those three stories. Now I think because he's the great teacher, he understood that we needed to hear it three different times. Three illustrations. One was not enough. But three times he's going to tell a story in order for us to understand the importance of how it is to rejoice and why it is to rejoice in our lives. I think if Jesus says something once, it's important. Amen? If He says it twice, it's really important. If He says it three times, I think He wants us to get that point and that truth. And it is about this rejoicing, that it is important to rejoice. Now here in Luke chapter 15, as He begins that parable, uh, one of the greatest statements that's made about Jesus is made here, even though it's made by these, this group in a derogatory manner. Let me show you what I mean. Verse 1 of Luke 15. Now all the tax gatherers and the sinners were coming near him to listen to Jesus. Here's that statement. Listen. And both the Pharisees and the scribes began to grumble, saying, underline this, this man, talking about Jesus, receives sinners and eats with them. That's a great statement about Jesus. Amen? This man, Jesus, he receives sinners and he even eats with them. Now you ought to say hallelujah, praise God for that. Amen? Now the reason you ought to say hallelujah and praise God for that is because you are one of them. Okay? I'm glad that Jesus receives sinners, that he receives us. And, and we're all sinners. For To be a sinner means to miss the mark, to not hit the target. Well, you know what the target God gives to us is? To be perfect. (laughs) You're just supposed to be perfect. And if you don't reach perfection, then you are a sinner. And none of us have reached perfection. We are all sinners. We are all standing in need of a Savior. And Jesus, it says, receives us. He welcomes us. It doesn't say He just receives us. It says something. And He eats with them. To eat with them is... Very important because it means it's not just that he casually likes a sinner, or he casually would be cordial to a sinner, but he actually chooses to fellowship with sinners. He actually cares about a sinner, and he did. Even though it's said in a derogatory manner, it's a great statement about Jesus. When Jesus, knowing what they said about him and about him living and being with sinners, Jesus gives this parable. 
with three stories. I'm not going to read the stories to you. I'll tell you the stories, and then we'll focus on a few important verses. The first story is about the man who has 100 sheep and loses one. Have you ever heard that story before? Yeah, almost all of us have heard that story. 100 sheep, and 99 of them are in the fold, but one of them is missing. And it says that that man, because he owns the sheep, it's not that he's a hireling, it's not that he's working for somebody, he actually owns these sheep, he cares about these sheep, you care about that which you own, amen? And he cares about those sheep to the point that whenever 99 of them were saved, one was missing, he leaves the 99 and he goes and he searches out for that one that's missing pointing out that every one of them, every sheep was important. And that's important too, because I've been that sheep before. What about you? I'm glad that whenever I'm not where I ought to be and I lose my way, I'm glad we have a shepherd who's looking for me. Amen? I'm glad he's not like most of us. Most of us say, well, if we got 99, we're doing pretty good. Just let the other one go. Let the wolves have him. Well, thank Jesus that he doesn't do that. Amen? that he cares about us. And so the shepherd goes out and he searches for that sheep. Notice what it says, when he, what he does when he finds a sheep. It's here in verse number 5. That's what it says. And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, circle this word, rejoicing. He rejoices. He rejoices because that which was lost has been found. That which he thought might be dead, he found to be alive. And he rejoices. He's excited about that. Not only does he rejoice, look what happens in verse 6. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. Not only did he rejoice, but it says that the natural thing to do is he calls and he gathers all of his neighbors and all of his friends and says, y'all come and let's rejoice together. For I thought I'd lost my sheep and my sheep has been found. Let's come and let's rejoice together. There was rejoicing in his heart. He gathers people around him to rejoice because that which was lost had been found. It is important to rejoice. Now, I know what that's like. Have you ever lost anything? Have you ever lost a child? <laughs> Have you ever lost your dog, your pet for your family? Have you ever lost something that was important for you and, and you were out there searching and you wondered if something was going to happen to them and you were going to be able to find them if it was lost forever and then you find it. And boy, there's great rejoicing. There's great satisfaction in the fact that you found it. And, and you not only want to rejoice, you want others to rejoice with you. The natural thing is to call people for rejoicing is something that we do together. And, and this man who had found that lost sheep was rejoicing. Well, you might, listen, my friend, that's what we're supposed to be doing together. That, that's what kind of church is about. Did you know it? It's the fact that we get to rejoice. And we don't only rejoice, we get to rejoice with other people, with our neighbors, our friends, our, our family. We have a chance to rejoice because that which was lost has now been found. Well, the second story. The second story is about a woman who had ten coins. Ten coins, it was called a drachma. It's actually equal to about a day's wages. And those ten silver coins were precious to her. They were important to her. It wasn't that they were worth that much. It was just ten days' wages. I mean, that's something. But it wasn't of great value. But to her, it was of great value. And whenever she found out that one of those coins was missing... She began to search her house. She swept her house. I'm sure she looked under the bed. She looked under the cushions of the couch. She did like most of us whenever we lose something in the house. You ever lost something in the house? Like car keys. Have you ever lost car keys? That's usually a general thing at our house is somebody's trying to find their car keys. Or what about this, man? What about the remote control? Now, I tell you what, we can do without the car, but the remote control, we've got to have. Amen? And, and that remote control, I mean, at my house, if my people will leave it alone, I know where I put that remote control. But when my kids come home, I can never find the remote control, and life has got to stop till we find it. 
We search far and wide and we rejoice when we find that which was lost. Well, this lady found her coin. She found that was precious to her, something that she owned and she thought she had lost it. Look what happens whenever she finds it, verse 9. And when she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin which I had lost. The natural thing when you find that which is lost is to rejoice and invite people you care about to rejoice with you. Well, then there's the third story. The story of the lost son or the prodigal son. You've heard that story, haven't you? A man had two sons. The youngest son came to him and said, Dad, I want you to give me all of what is mine and I'm going to go and make my own way. So the father gave to him. Even though it didn't have to, he gave to him his portion of the inheritance. And that boy, in a few days, gathers all of his stuff and goes to the far country. Now, when that boy went to the far country, in his mind, he thought that he was going to go over there and be a great success. <laughs> he didn't plan to fail. He was going to go over there and he's going to take his stuff and be a great success. And he's going to come back one day riding on a white horse and show his dad how successful he's been. Well, that isn't exactly the way it ended up, was it? And it's not that way whenever we decide to take what God gives us and separate from God and go to the far country. It doesn't work very well either for us. But that's what he was going to do. Well, he goes to the far country. He wastes all of what he has and he ends up feeding hogs to one of the people of that country and And he got so hungry that he wanted to eat what the hogs were eating. Now, I have been hungry before, but not quite that hungry yet. That I want to eat what the hogs eat. And the man wouldn't even let it eat it. You can't have it. That's for my hogs. Finally, in that situation, he came to his senses, it says. And he came to his senses and he said, My father's servants live better than I live. They had something to eat. So I'm going to get up and I'm going to leave here. I'm going to go back to my father's house. And I'm going to tell him, I no longer deserve to be your son, but I would like to be your servant. I have wronged you. I'm sorry. Would you let me be your servant? And he made a decision, and he got up and went towards home. That's a great decision he made. Whenever he's walking up to the house, his father, who is always looking for him, sees that familiar walk, and he runs out to get him. And whenever he runs out to him, that Young boy begins his speech. Dad, I have wronged you and I, I, I don't deserve to be a son. But his dad doesn't listen to his speech. He interrupts the speech and he says to his servants, Go and get a robe for my son and ring for his fingers and sandals on his feet and go kill the fatted calf for my son who is dead is now alive and we're going to celebrate. We are rejoicing. We're going to make merry. That's what it says happens there in verse 23. It says... And bring the fatted calf, kill it, and let us eat and be merry. For this son of mine was dead and has come to life again. He was lost and has been found, and they began to be merry. In other words, he didn't celebrate alone. He celebrated and rejoiced with the people he gathered around as they enjoyed the fatted calf. They celebrated, they made merry, they rejoiced because that which was lost had been found. You see the theme that Jesus is presenting? Jesus presents this theme that we need to learn how to rejoice. And we need to rejoice with other people and gather around and rejoice. Anytime that which is lost is found or that which is dead has been brought back to life, there is reason to rejoice. We need to rejoice. And that is the theme of this parable. Now... Jesus helps us as the great teacher to make the application. He doesn't leave us to discern what the application is. He tells us the application. I didn't read these verses, but let's go back and look at them. In Luke chapter 15, after he has told the story of the sheep and the one being found, this is what Jesus says in verse 7. I tell you... That in the same way there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. You hear the application? Jesus said, just as that man found his one sheep 
and he is rejoicing with his friends, he said there is greater joy than that in heaven. There's greater joy than that in heaven. Listen, when one sinner repents, when one sinner comes to life, when one sinner that was lost has been found, there is rejoicing, great and glorious rejoicing that goes on in heaven. Wow! There's rejoicing that goes on in heaven when a sinner comes to God, when a sinner is found. Well, look what he says about the coin. Verse number 10. In the same way, just as that woman was rejoicing, I tell you there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. There is great joy and rejoicing in heaven. Great joy and rejoicing in heaven. And then the very last verse of the chapter, whenever the father says to his older son, we'll talk about it in a minute, we had to be merry and rejoice for this brother of yours was dead and has begun to live and was lost and has been found. Here's the application. That the reason that we're to rejoice whenever a sinner repents, the re reason we're to gather together as the church and rejoice when one life has been transformed is because that's what's happening in heaven. That's what's happening in heaven. And see, whatever's happening in heaven, that's what's supposed to be happening here. Whatever's taking place in heaven, that's what we're supposed to be doing here. Now you know that because of the model prayer. Do you remember the model prayer? Some people call it the Lord's Prayer. Most of us know that. Most of us could quote that. There's one little section in that prayer that says this. That thy will be done in earth. What's the rest of it? Thy will be done in earth as what? As it's being done where? In heaven. So in other words, the model prayer and how Jesus teaches us to pray is this. That, that God, that you would let happen here in this world, on this earth, you would let happen here what is happening in heaven. We should be trying to do here what's happening in heaven. And what Jesus said is this, every time a sinner repents, there is great rejoicing in heaven. Every time a sinner comes to God, there's great rejoicing in heaven. And therefore, if it's happening in heaven... Where should it happen? Right here. If there's rejoicing in heaven, the church of the living God ought to be rejoicing. We ought to celebrate any time somebody comes and gives their heart to Jesus. There's great celebration. Any time a sinner repents, there's great celebration. Any time a believer is restored in fellowship, there ought to be celebration. Any time a family is restored and reconciled there ought to be celebration what Jesus is saying is there is reason to rejoice and we need to learn how to rejoice how to celebrate just as the shepherd did the woman did and the father did as they rejoiced when that which was lost had been found well, there's another person in this parable that Jesus identifies. We haven't talked about him yet. And I believe the reason he's here is because he's here to warn us not to respond this way whenever your brother comes home. You remember that other person in the prodigal son story? What's his name? The older, elder brother. That's right. The older brother. Now... Whenever the son comes home, the father's rejoicing. He's killed the fatted calf. He's invited other people in to be merry. But then there's the older brother. Look what it says about this older brother here in verse 25. Now his older brother was in the field, and when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. And he summoned one of the servants and began inquiring what these things might be. And he said to him, Your brother has come, and your father has killed a fattened calf because he's received him back safe 
and sound. You ought to underline this, verse 28. And he, talking about the older brother, became angry. He became angry and was not willing to go in. And his father came out and began entreating him. Boy, that isn't the right response, is it? I mean, dad's over here rejoicing because his son has come home and the older brother gets angry. He gets angry because there's his brother's home. He gets angry because the calf has been killed. He gets angry because there's a celebration going on. He's angry. And his father finds out that his son is out there and not coming in to celebrate. And the father goes out and pleads and says, Please, son, your brother's home and, and he's alive and, and he's been found. And you need to come in. You need to come in and celebrate. You need to come in and rejoice. There's a feast going on. You need to come in. And even though the father pleaded for the older son to come in, he refused to come in. Boy, I hope that the picture that is painted by the church today is not one of the older brother. I, I, I hope that, that God the Father is not telling us, boy, please rejoice. Pleads with us to rejoice that somebody's saved. Re, rejoice that... I am moving, rejoice that a sinner repents. The Father's pleading, but that we're not hearing. And, and we're not joining in in that rejoicing. We're not joining in in that celebration. I, what a pitiful thing it would be if, if the older brother is a picture of us. A picture of us as the church. A, a picture of us as, as individual believers. That we would not rejoice that our brother who was lost, has come home. Now, why would that brother act that way? Why would he act that way? Well, he gives details about why he would act that way. Let's know what happens here. Verse 29. The older brother answered and said to his father, Listen now, look, look, for so many years I've been serving you, and I have never neglected a command of yours, and yet you've never given me a kid that I might be merry with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who had devoured your wealth with harlots, you killed a fattened calf for him. And he said to him, My child, you have always been with me. All that is mine is yours. We had to be merry and rejoice, for this brother of yours was dead and has begun to live, was lost and has been found. It, he tells you why he doesn't rejoice. He tells you why he doesn't respond the way the father does and the way he should have responded. Here's the first thing. He thinks of himself more as a servant than he does a son. You need to write that down. He sees himself more as a servant. Here was his response to them. Hey, Dad, you know, I have served you every day of my life and I've always done what you've commanded. I have been a faithful servant. I'm doing what I have to do. Listen, he has a wrong perspective if he sees himself as a servant rather than a child. There's a big difference between being a servant and a son or a servant and a daughter. And his problem with his great father that he has, and he is a great father, he's a picture of what God's like. This great father he has, he doesn't enjoy what he has as a son because he thinks he is a servant. He, he thinks he's there to serve his father instead of having a relationship with his father. And that's not true. I, I think sometimes we sometimes feel the same way. We sometimes respond the same way. It, it's almost like as Christians we think we've got to serve God. And I'm out here serving God and, I, and I'm doing for God what I need to do. Let me tell you something. God doesn't need more servants. He's got all he has and all he needs. He's got angels who are ministering servants, and those angels can take care of everything he needs done. You hear that? He really does not need servants. He didn't come to make you a servant. He came to make you a child. And there's a big difference between being a servant and being a son. And he called us to be children of his. You know what that means? That means that anything a child enjoys, everybody gets to enjoy. That older brother... He didn't leave his father's house and go off to the far country. But if he had, his father would have received him back just like he did his younger brother. You know why? Because his father saw him as a son, not a servant. 
If you in your life spend your whole time as a Christian thinking of yourself as a servant for God and you don't realize the privilege you have of being a son or daughter of the king, you're never going to rejoice like you can and like you should. You need to understand that you are special, that you are that one that he will search for diligently, that you are the one that he will receive back whenever you've messed up, and that he considers you a child, and as his child, you're the most precious thing that he has. And that older brother saw himself as a servant rather than a son. And therefore, he couldn't rejoice with his brother. Second thing, he moved into that comparative game. You know what a comparative game is? Comparative game is where you compare yourself to somebody else. He got into that comparative game. You heard what he said, didn't you? Hey, listen, my, my friends and I, you didn't even give us a goat. Isn't that what he said? I mean, well, you, you didn't even give us a goat where we could have a party. But this son of yours who has gone out and wasted all your wealth, he comes home and you kill the fatted calf. I'm not worth a goat and he's worth a fatted calf. That's called the comparison game. <laughs> You're comparing yourself and comparing the circumstances and situations that you have with your heavenly father to somebody else. Boy, look what they've got. Look what they have. Look what went into their life. Look what I have compared to... They've got some... If you get in that comparative game, you're always going to come out on the wrong end. Isn't it amazing how we compare people and we want to compare and somebody's always got it better than I've got it? Let me tell you, there's two sides of that story. If you'll open your eyes and look on the other side, you got it better than somebody else has. But for some reason, we don't ever see that part. We just see somebody's got it better than me. And that's what that guy said. Hey, listen, I don't even deserve... He could have had a goat. He could have had a fatted calf. All he had to do was ask for it. All he had to do really is go get it because his father tells him everything is mine is yours. He just didn't ask for it. But he got caught up into that thing and the old enemy does that to us. Gets caught up in that thing to comparing yourself with somebody else and he felt like in comparison that his brother was of greater value than he was and, and that's not true. For what did the father say? The father said this, he said, son, I want you to know this. You've always been with me. He was the oldest son, he's always been with him. He'd been there for the younger son ever so. You've been with me. And listen, he goes on. And all that I have is yours. That's not the role of a servant. Servant never is told that. But a son, a child is told that. All that is mine is yours. All I have is yours. Don't you realize how blessed you are? And the answer is no. He did not realize how blessed he was. When he saw himself as a servant instead of a son, when he compared himself and felt like he came up on the lower end of the deal, and when he failed to realize that everything that the father had was his, when he failed to see all those things, he didn't respond in rejoicing like he should have, but rather with an angry spirit. Well, let's pray before God that we not be an elder brother, that we not be like that, but rather we'd be like the Father. And the Father is the one that when there's one sinner who repents, there is great rejoicing going on. Now, I'll tell you, as a fellowship, we need to learn how to rejoice. Amen? We've had some children walk down this aisle, give their heart to Jesus, and that ought to be a hallelujah celebration time. Adult come and give their heart to Jesus. We ought to celebrate that together. We ought to rejoice together. When a believer who's been out of fellowship comes back to the family and gets involved and God restores them, that's reason to rejoice. When a family is restored, that's reason to rejoice. And, and may we say, God, help us to hear the master teacher who teaches us in three different stories the importance of rejoicing and tells us that there's greater rejoicing in heaven than even in that, and that we should join in that rejoicing. God, help us to learn to celebrate life. To celebrate, to rejoice in life. Because Jesus does. Because heaven does. And because there is reason to rejoice. When one person gives their heart to God. When one person makes that decision 
and turns their life to God. There is reason to rejoice. I hope you will be a rejoicer. I hope that you'll be one who celebrates. I hope when you see your brother or sister get their life right, that you join the Father's side, the heavenly side, rather than the temptation of being on the older brother's side. Let's be where God wants us to be. Amen? Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for truth. I thank you for your Holy Spirit who teaches us. And I ask, Father, right now that you will help us as your children to rejoice and to rejoice greatly, just as Jesus did and Jesus taught us to. And for us to join the chorus of heaven in the celebration of one sinner who repents. Father, I pray that you would help us to be a rejoicing, celebrating fellowship. And that we would come here every time we gather expecting there to be cause and reason to rejoice. You do that in us. Friend, if you're here today and you've never given your heart to Jesus, could I encourage you to give your heart and your life to Him? He's the greatest friend you'll ever have, the only Savior there's ever been, the only one who died on a cross to pay the price for your sin and to offer you salvation. And He's done all that for you because He loves you. He receives sinners, and I'm so thankful He does. If you've never given your heart to Him, you can do that today, and we invite you to do it right now. You step out in this church aisle, and we'll help you know how to pray the sinner's prayer and to give your heart to Jesus. Will you come? Will you do that? What about you, child of God? Maybe you say, I I know I'm saved, but I've just not been where I need to be in fellowship with God. There are things in my life that have caused me to be in the far country, and I want to be restored. I want to be home. And I want God to forgive me and to cleanse me. Maybe today's that day you want to make that decision, that commitment to draw closer to the Lord. And and there is reason for rejoicing when you do that. Maybe you're here and you've been praying about a church home. And God's spoken to you. He wants you to be a part of this fellowship, the Parker family. We'd love to have you come. If you don't have a church home, we'd love to have you here to join with us in worship, celebration, ministry, to fellowship together. We serve a perfect Lord. We're trying to please Him and to learn more about how to serve Him and how to walk with Him and how to be what He wants us to be and to appreciate what it is to be children of God. So if God's leading you to come, be a part of our fellowship, we're here to help you to know how to do that. We just want this invitation time. The most precious part of our service is this invitation time. And we want each of us to be sensitive and to let God's Spirit have His will and His way in our lives.